Hi, everybody. I'm Miguel Busquets, and I'm with Retin Associates of Kentucky, and I want to uh, thank you for joining this presentation tonight. Um, as I think uh, most of you know, this was supposed to be a live event, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we're all having to think of uh, new ways to do things and stay connected, uh, and that includes uh, continuing medical education. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to uh, join this event, and hopefully we can uh, get together in the future in person and uh, do this the way we used to do it. But for now, hopefully this will suffice. Please feel free to um, contact me, reach out to me, text, call, email, call the practice, however you'd like to do it. If you have questions about anything uh, within this presentation, as obviously we're not going to have the opportunity to exchange questions, which is what I, uh, uh, questions and answers is what I really like to do. So without further ado, I will get started. Um, and I'm going to uh, let you access the uh, slideshow here. So I'm going to slideshow, we're going to get going. So tonight we're going to talk um, about uh, the extremes of vitroretinal surgery and we're going to, uh, the, the presentation is entitled Update on Vitrectomy and Macular Surgery because we're going to talk about uh, perhaps the simplest procedure that we do which is vitrectomy for floaters and vitreous opacities. Um, and then uh, go all the way to uh, the other end of uh, the vitro-rental interface and talk about macular surgery, which is a little more uh, complicated and delicate, but, but I think both are very interesting and uh, patients uh, on both ends of the spectrum here really need these procedures and uh, need our help in uh, helping them figure out who needs to have surgery and who doesn't. So the objectives of uh, tonight's talk are to uh, define uh, vitro-macular adhesion and vitro-macular traction. Uh, we want to uh, also be able to discuss the International Vitromacular Attraction Study Group Classification Model. Uh, we want to be able to identify indications for epiretinal membrane surgery and discuss uh, the prognosis for these patients. And we also want to discuss risks and benefits uh, of vitrectomy surgery for floaters. So if we can accomplish those goals tonight, we will have accomplished our mission. So let's start out with um, macular surgery and talk about the dip different types of macular surgery and what the different diagnoses um, that we treat with this procedure are. Uh, and they really include three different categories. It's vitromacular traction, epiretinal membranes, and macular holes. So uh, for all of these uh, conditions, the Amsler grid is a, a very good tool to use uh, and a very good way to uh, determine what a patient's symptoms are. You, they can actually, you know, you can give them the Amsler grid and they can describe what they're seeing. You can have them draw it. But in all three of these conditions, patients are gonna notice, uh, by and large, some degree of distortion or metamorphosis, as we can see here on the Amsler grid. And um, varying degrees of a central blind spot or central scotoma, uh, you know, in the case of a macular hole, it actually becomes a full uh, central scotoma. Uh, obviously, there's other conditions that can do this, but we're gonna focus on the uh, vitromacular tractional uh, conditions uh, for which macular surgery is an indication tonight. Uh, so let's start with the um, first uh, stage or phase of this, which is VMA or vitromacular adhe adhesion. Uh, we see this all the time on our OCTs. You can see this on the, uh, 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 in the photograph here as an onfos of a, um, of a macula here. You can see this on the retinal scan uh, that uh, is following the arrow. The posterior hyoid or the uh, posterior face of the vitreous um, uh, uh, within the eye is just really uh, adherent to the very center of the foveal contour. Um, this is something that we see very frequently. And by definition, what this is, is a perifoveal vitreous detachment without retinal abnormalities. Um, it's a macular vitreous attachment that's within three millimeters um, of the radius of the fovea. Uh, so three millimeters of the, center, of, of the uh, foveal center, it's, uh, therefore within a three millimeter radius. Um, it is an anatomic phenomenon and it's dissociated from any subjective symptoms. So very rarely will, will a patient actually have symptoms uh, from this condition. Uh, it can dis be described as focal, so that means that it's, uh, the adhesion is less than 1,500 microns, or about the uh, a disc area, uh, or disc diameter, I should say, uh, or it can be described as broad, and that would be between 1,500 microns and three millimeters. Um, and it can be isolated or, or concurrent. Isolated meaning that it's uh, not occurring in the presence of uh, other ocular diseases. So you can see right away here uh, with the drawing on, uh, or the uh, image on the right, which is a, a OCT scan, 
uh, depicting vitreous attraction, that there's an immediate difference here. You still have the adhesion or uh, the posterior hyaloid um, uh, connected uh, to the fovea. Uh, you can see that interface there. But uh, as the arrow manifests here, you can see that there's an, uh, an obvious loss of the foveal uh, contour. So uh, the macular region, the fovea macular region is being pull, pulled inward into the eye here. Uh, and as a result of that, you can see uh, cystic cavities um, and even a separation of the uh, photoreceptor, uh, photoreceptor layer from the retinal pigment epithelium. Um, so as we talk about this, we want to bear in mind uh, that uh, with, with the advent of OCT uh, and uh, as we've learned more about vitreomacular attraction, the International Vitreomacular Attraction Study Group uh, was formed to classify vitreomacular adhesion, traction, and macular holes. And we'll go over that uh, classification uh, uh, system in a little bit. Uh, so as we discussed, uh, VMT, you can get an intraretinal cyst, as we see here, or intraretinal cyst plural elevation uh, from the RPE, as you see here at the bottom, there's a concurrent perifoveal uh, posterior vitreous detachment, as you see with this space here, and that's essentially what uh, uh, typifies vitreomacular attraction. Um, and once again, it can be focal or broad, isolated or concurrent, as with uh, uh, VMA. Uh, just a broader picture of the same thing to give you a better idea of what we're talking about. And you can see how these patients, as opposed to those that have VMA, are, are going to be symptomatic. It would be very unusual for a patient to present with this OCT and not have symptoms. So let's move on to epiretinal membranes. Um, and bear in mind that these uh, conditions can present in combination uh, with each other. Uh, they do not have to be isolated, and we'll go over some examples of that. Uh, so what is an epiretinal membrane? It's really fibrous tissue that's resulting in contraction of the macula. It's a response to vitreous synoresis traction or separation. Uh, 75 to 93% of these uh, will occur in association with a PVD or posterior vitreous detachment. Uh, and what's happening here is that laminocytes, uh, which are glial cells, collagen cells, and fibrocytes uh, are uh, really the primary cellular component that is uh, leading to uh, a reaction known as gliosis or fibrosis. This is what's leading to the fibrous tissue uh, building up uh, uh, on the retina. Uh, on the macula specifically and causing contraction. Uh, there's also leukocytes, specifically macrophage infiltration through micro tears uh, that occur in the retina, um, usually with uh, uh, the, the advent of a PVD or other tractional anomalies on the surface of the macula. Uh, so uh, leukocytes as well as retinal astrocytes will migrate through small tears in the retina and small tears in the ILM or internal limiting membrane and they settle on the surface of the macula, thus leading to the scar tissue and ultimate contraction. Uh, and it should also be mentioned that uh, retinal pigment epithelial cells and red blood cells uh, can also uh, cause uh, epiretinal membranes. These are typically associated with retinal tears or detachments uh, and are really associated with um, a form of PVR, or proliferative vitreal retinopathy. So these membranes will usually be a little more severe, uh, a little more pronounced, actually easier to remove because they're so pronounced but can have a more significant impact on the vision while they're there, typically. And we'll also show some, some pictures of that. So uh, here's a picture of an uh, epiretinal membrane. You can see the distorted macula. One of the classic features that we see uh, is straightening of the uh, blood vessels over the papillomacular bundle. Uh, the epiretinal membrane here is off to the side, uh, temporal. Uh, and the point here is that the membrane, this is a pretty significant one, but it doesn't have to be right over the macula to cause problems. Uh, as long as there's traction, it can cause distortion of the macular tissue and of the vision. In a case like this, you would probably also see, if you did a fluorescein angiogram, some cystoid macular edema on an OCT, you might also see uh, cystoid spaces resulting from that leakage and also from the uh, mechanical traction. Another example of a picture taken intraoperatively of a macular pucker. Uh, this one is uh, a little uh, more directly over the macula itself. One like this would be pretty easy to remove with a pick um, and some forceps. So what are the symptoms of epiretinal membrane? Uh, typically, the uh, metamorphopsia or visual distortion that can be uh, documented in an Amsler grid, reduced visual acuity, but also uh, macropsia. So the first two we typically see with the other um, uh, vitromacular uh, tractional conditions, um, uh, or with VMT in particular, uh, but the macropsia is something that's relatively specific uh, to epiretinal membrane. So if a patient presents with that, uh, with that symptom, you want to be looking uh, for this. Um, I, I put this list of uh, synonyms for uh, epiretinal membranes because um, 
it goes by a lot of different names and people will call them different things. Uh, a lot of times, depending on uh, what part of the country somebody's practicing in. Um, but uh, epirenal membrane, we typically use this to refer to membranes uh, that are overlying the macula, but they re could really be technically, by definition, anywhere over the retina, such as a, a case where there's peripheral membranes and PVR, those are technically epirental membranes. So more specifically to what we're referring to here, uh, we're really talking about epimacular membrane or an EM, and that's a more specific term. Uh, also goes by the uh, term macular pucker uh, or PMF, premacular fibrosis, uh, preretinal membrane, macular gliosis, or cellophane maculopathy because the membrane itself looks like uh, cellophane. So hence the name. Here's a picture of an epiretinal membrane. I apologize if the uh, image is a little bit blurry here. I think some of this is the uh, Zoom um, uh, presentation and uh, the uh, image getting translated through through the Zoom module here. Uh, but this is epiretinal membrane. You can see a pretty thick membrane here overlying uh, the uh, macula as the arrow is pointing to. You can also see some sub-RPE cystoid spaces. This is a pretty a pretty significant ERM. So if you saw this, this patient probably needs surgery, and we're going to talk here in a second about how we make that determination. So what are some of the subjective indications for surgery for epiretinal membranes? Uh, number one, as we talked about metamorphopsia, patient uh, you know is having distorted vision. That's you know somebody who's probably going to uh, uh, you know want to have surgery. Oftentimes, uh, blurred vision. Patient will come complaining of blurred vision. Anisoconia. Um, is another one because of the macropsia. A central scotoma can result from this, as we saw in the uh, picture of the Amsler grid earlier on, as well as difficulties with activities of uh, daily living. So as opposed to the subjective indications, what are the objective indications for surgery? We want to look for reduced visual acuity, um, documentable Amsler grid changes that correlate with the uh, metamorphopsia. And again, that to me is more important than the visual acuity. Uh, visual acuity is one measure, but uh, you know there are some patients, uh, not often, some patients have a 20-25 membrane, um, probably one number out of 20-20, but a 20-25 membrane that have severe metamorphopsia, often seen in, in younger patients, um, and those are some of the happiest patients postoperatively. So visual acuity is important, but metamorphopsia is more important. Progression of visual loss is also something, uh, if you can document, uh, uh, counts as an indication. Exacerbation of concomitant conditions, such as uh, diabetic macular edema, age-related macular degeneration, uh, cystoid macular edema, postoperatively, those sorts of things. And then again, the OCT findings, um, specifically increased central foveal thickness or uh, the ectopic interfoveal layer um, uh, classification scheme findings that we're going to go over in a second here. So again, just to kind of go over here, a couple examples, uh, surgery. Uh, versus no surgery. Um, you know, this uh, image A on the top, probably a patient we're not going to operate on. Why? You can see the epiretinal membrane, but the foveal contour is preserved. There's not really increased thickness. The retinal architecture is maintained. Whereas image B on the bottom, thick epiretinal membrane, sub uh, ILM cystoid spaces, irregularities of the uh, contour, uh, of the uh, inner macular contour, um, and then just some disruption. Uh, of the uh, retinal architecture. So when you look at that intuitively, you kind of know that's a bad membrane. It's probably going to need surgery. It's probably correlated with bad vision. But what are we really looking at objectively? When we see that and we know it's a bad membrane, it's probably going to need surgery, what are we looking at? So this is uh, hot off the presses here um, regarding epiretinal membrane prognosis postoperatively. Uh, and it's based on what's called the uh, ectopic interfoveal layer classification scheme by Gonzalez et al. This is just in the most recent uh, issue of our uh, journal Retina. Uh, now in April. So what they did is they tried to put together, based on uh, a study of um, uh, OCT findings in patients with epiretinal membranes, um, a, si a staging system similar to what we have for macular holes from stage one to four, where, we c where they really um, assess their severity. So in stage one, which is, it correlates to the top image, uh, we have um, a fo uh, foveal depression that's preserved, and uh, you can see the epiretinal membrane. Now, this is somebody that you'll rarely operate. Stage two, you start to get loss of the foveal depression. Again, you can see the epiretinal membrane lining the uh, uh, inner retina there. Um, and uh, here, though, you have the additional finding of what's called outer nuclear layer thickening. So you can see that thickening, that increased space here, as the arrow is pointing to, between the black lines. So 92% of patients with a stage two ERM based on this classification scheme will uh, end up with vision better than 2040 or 2040 or better. Uh, and 70% will return to stage one, okay? Stage three, now we have uh, a clearly identifiable between the black and um, outer white line, ectopic interfoveal layer. Um, and this finding 
uh, is really what separates the membranes that are okay from those that are starting to really cause problems. Only 42% of these in this study uh, achieved uh, vision better than 2040 uh, postoperatively. And then we have stage four, which is the same thing where you have the uh, ectopic interfovial layer, but also a complete loss of the um, retinal architecture. Um, and you can just see that there are just no identifiable bands uh, there within the uh, layers of the retina. Only 5% of these uh, patients will get vision better than 2040. Um, so what's the lesson here? Early surgery is, imp uh, is imperative. Uh, it's important to catch these patients early and to operate on them when, before they get to stage three or four, ideally. That doesn't mean we don't operate on stage three or four. They need surgery. They do improve with surgery typically. But we're going to be much happier if we can catch them at stage two as is the patient. Now, this is a challenge because it's sort of like glaucoma patients trying to convince them to use their drops. Uh, you know, if something isn't currently wrong or severely um, aggravating them, the patient might be hesitant to proceed. So you know, we're in a situation where we have to kind of convince them of, of what might happen in the future if we don't do it. A lot of the stage two patients will want surgery, especially if they're you know, highly active or high functioning, um, but some, others won't. And then it just becomes a discussion. Um, they just need to be educated as to you know, where this can go, what the statistics are, um, and of course other uh, comorbidities factor into this, whether they're monocular or not. Uh, and what their needs are. And again, uh, we have to individualize these decisions. But as far as outcome and prognosis goes, we want to get these patients at stage two or better. And that's an important point of this talk. So there's some macular tractional pathology variants that I just want to go over. So this is an epiretinal membrane without a PVD. This is what I would call a partial PVD here. And you can see on the image on the right here, this OCT, you have the, uh, you can see the posterior hyaloid is connected to the nerve uh, that uh, is off the, uh, field here, but it would be off to the right on the screen. And uh, you can see that uh, you have this epiretinal membrane. Uh, the, the hyaloid has come off the macula, probably induced some micro tears in the ILM, and we had the gliotic and fibrotic reaction that led to the epiretinal membrane. But there's not always a PVD, uh, a full PVD in, the, uh, in these cases. Um, uh, this is another case of uh, vitro macular retraction with an epiretinal membrane. So we have a perifoveal detachment of the hyaloid, but the, uh, um, you know, we still have the hyaloid attached to the macula. Still, that can induce an epiretinal membrane, as we can see here in the various images. Phenomenon called vitreoschisis uh, that we should cover. Um, this is really just a splitting of the vitreous or the uh, posterior hyaloid. You can see various, uh, the two layers here in this picture of, of the vitreous. Um, this is significant because a lot of patients that have uh, floaters will have vitreoschisis, so they'll have what we think is a PVD. Uh, we'll take the floaters out and then a year later they'll come back with floaters again when the other half of the vitreous comes off. So there's an interesting phenomenon. You can sometimes see it on OCT. Another image showing the same thing with the various layers of the vitreous and a lot of distortion, and, uh, vitromacular attraction at the same time, distortion of the retinal architecture. Um, there's another picture uh, more close up. And here's vitreous with an epiretinal membrane. So just another variant. Um, Macular pseudocyst is another term that you'll hear. So macular pseudocysts um, are essentially lamellar macular holes with a little roof over them. And um, we'll cover lamellar holes at partial thickness all in a second, with the roof being the epiretinal membrane. So that's what's called a pseudocyst because that's not retinal tissue, that's the epiretinal membrane there. So another variant that you'll see. Macular PBR, there's a patient that had bilateral detachments that I operated on a couple months ago. Um, and had a, de a long-standing detachment of both eyes uh, for a few months um, and uh, came in essentially with primary PBR. Did a retinectomy, but you can see here between the white dots uh, where the arrows uh, demarcating right now that there's a pretty significant membrane there. You can see it on the Onfoss image a little bit better here. Uh, looks like a C fan. And this is causing pretty significant distortion of the macula. Um, and uh, loss of the architecture. So this would be a stage four memory. Macular PBR memories are usually pretty severe. <clears throat> so um, another interesting case here, it's combined vitromacular traction with a lamellar macular hole. You can see clearly the, the VMT, um, as well as um, a partial thickness hole here. Really, this would be more of a, of a macular cyst, um, technically speaking, because uh, you can see that the, you know, the uh, inner uh, nuclear layers um, or, or the inner retinal layers are preserved and they've actually formed 
um, assist. It's somewhere between that and a lamellar macular hole. Here's another interesting one where we have vitromacular traction uh, with a macular cyst, not a pseudocyst. This is actual retinal tissue. But then uh, also a stage two macular hole. This is through and through. Typically, uh, this bridge internally would have um, percolated. Um, it would be either a stage three or a stage uh, four macular hole. But it hasn't happened yet. So we're catching it pretty early. So this is about macular traction leading to uh, uh, a stage two macular hole. <coughs> And then uh, last but not least of the interesting cases here, this is a patient that came in, she was 16 years old, um, came in asymptomatically with this uh, lesion. Um, this was deemed to be a combined hematoma of the retina and retinal pigment epithelium, another interesting phenomenon that uh, you'll see in patients from time to time. Uh, this is asymptomatic, not in the macula, does not require surgery, obviously in this case. They can be operated on if they are in the macula or symptomatic. This can be associated with neurofibromatosis type two, but, uh, uh, in this case, it was not, and it's asymptomatic, so this is one that we just observe. So uh, moving on here to lamellar macular holes, um, this uh, is a phenomenon, we're really talking about a partial thickness uh, macular hole, and what you have is an irregular foveal contour, interfoveal defect, an intact photoreceptor layer, and it's usually associated with an epiretinal membrane. You can see all these characteristics here. Um, the irregular foveal contour, the epiretinal membrane, separation of the, uh, between the inner and outer layers of the retina, defect of the inner fovea, and an intact outer retina is the key here. These uh, patients, here you have a, uh, a partial PVD. They will, will usually have an epiretinal membrane, and uh, sometimes you have to operate on these, oftentimes you don't. Um, an article by Haritoglu et al., uh, in clinical ophthalmology in January of 2019, <coughs> excuse me, um, differentiate between degenerative and tractional lamellar macular holes. And uh, it was found that degenerative uh, macular holes, where you start to get a lot of uh, breakdown of the retinal architecture, a lot of cystoid spaces, these patients do not do well with uh, retinal surgery, detrectomy surgery, with membrane stripping. Whereas the more tractional ones, such as this one, where you really just have, you really just have the epiretinal membrane, tractional changes, not a lot of breakdown of the tissue. If the vision is uh, decreased in these uh, cases and the, and the patients have symptoms, we can go ahead and operate on those. So moving on to macular holes. The macular holes, we're talking typically, when we talk about macular, we're talking about a full thickness macular hole. Here's some pictures of them. We've all seen them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what are the uh, patient symptoms when there is a macular hole? Uh, normal vision here on the left, central scotoma on the right with a macular hole, as you would expect. Um, I want to go over the differences between the uh, uh, internal vitromacular traction study group classification system for macular holes um, and the traditional gas classification of macular holes. Uh, we have the gas classification on the left and the uh, new, we'll call it the new classification on the right here, from stage zero to stage four. So in the gas classification, stage zero, really just talking about VMA. Stage one or an impending macular hole, that's really just VMP, where you have the separation of the photoreceptors from the retinal pigment epithelium. Stage two in the gas classification, these are macular holes that are less than 200 microns with or without a PVD. In the new classification, they made it 250 uh, without, with or without the macular traction. So now we go kind of, uh, uh, classifying it the opposite way, not whether or not there's a PVD, but whether or not there's vitromacular traction. And then stage three uh, is what we call a large macular hole, more than uh, 200 microns or greater without a PVD. Um, here we're really talking about in the new classification system, uh, holes that are between 201 and 200 and 250, which are still considered small in this scheme. Medium holes between 251 and 400 microns or large holes that are greater than 400 microns. Um, that are full thickness macular holes. Again, in this case, with vitromacular traction or without a PVD. And finally, stage four, full thickness macular holes with a PVD. And that uh, includes small, medium, or large full thickness macular holes without vitromacular traction uh, with the new system. So there's no PVD, uh, or if there is a PVD and there's no uh, vitromacular traction on the macular hole, that's automatically a stage four 
uh, macular whole or small, medium, or large. So I will tell you that even though the uh, new class of international macular traction study classification system is kind of fancier and trendier, we still use uh, <laughs> the gas classification. It's just simpler. It makes sense. We know what it is. So here's some pictures. Again, back to the original picture we showed earlier. This is a stage 1B macular hole. That's VMT. Basically, what you have is the, the traction, uh, the posterior alley point inward, cystoid changes, elevation of uh, the uh, uh, photoreceptor layer from the RPE. Um, sometimes you'll get a little bit of, uh, of a hyperreflective uh, focus here or hyperreflective foci on an OCT due to clumping of the photoreceptors. Um, in this, uh, you know, stage, therefore, a stage 1B macular hole can be difficult to differentiate sometimes, especially if you have media pass, it's not a good OCT or a clear image from, say, a drusenoid PED or a vitelliform lesion um, because they look very similar on OCT. But this is uh, the stage 1B hole with the elevation of the uh, photoreceptor layer from the RPE. Stage, uh, stage 2 macular holes is less than 200 microns. You can still see cystoid changes this is with or without a PVD. In, the, uh, in this case. And then stage three, now we're about 300 microns. Hyaloid's still technically attached. It's off the, off the macula, you have a little perculum there, off the fovea, but it's still connected at the, macula, at the optic nerve. Uh, it's about a 300 micron hole with a PVD, uh, or I'm sorry, without a PVD. Uh, and then stage four, this is about a 400 micron hole. Um, and here there's no uh, uh, vitreous connected still to the macular hole. So uh, this is with a PVD, um, and that's the definition of a stage four. It's a larger hole without the hyaloid attached. Uh, and again, stage one, two, three, four, a lot easier than the, uh, the newer classification system, but good to know the new classification system as it pertains to the VMT, and it connects the whole spectrum from VMT to macular holes. So we're gonna go through a video now um, of surgery for a patient that had vitreous macular traction and an epiretinal membrane. And I'll just run this. This is uh, using the ingenuity, so it's gonna it's a binocular image, so you can focus on either side. This is what's called a uh, modified retrobulbar block using a Roos needle um, that I use. So the medication is injected subconjunctively and retrobulbar uh, in a retrobulbar fashion at the same time. And we're introducing the ports here, ten to an eight o'clock positions. This is a twenty-five gauge surgery. The infusion cannula is being uh, Place infratemporally and turned on after it's visualized the vitreous cavity. We start with a core and peripheral vitrectomy. Um, core vitrectomy is performed at this point. Uh, trying to aspirate hyaloid wasn't coming up, uh, so we're using uh, tramcinolone to stain the hyaloid. And now you can see using the uh, uh, vitrectomy probe, we're actually elevating that posterior hyaloid from around the optic nerves coming off the optic nerve and the macula. Much easier when we stain it. We're now going to do a complete the core and peripheral vitrectomy with the vitrector. ICG going into the eye to stain uh, the posterior pole. What you see here is negative staining. Use a macular contact lens so we can uh, do this. There's a flex loop um, instrument that we use uh, to elevate the internal lining membrane. You can see the little strip there. And the negative staining where it's not green indicates where the epiretinal membrane is. The ILM, internal lining membrane, is staining green. Now we're using a mass grip forcep to remove all of that. You can see that coming off the macula. So we remove the VMT and the ERM in that situation. <coughs> Ports are removed. Self-sealing sclerotomies, checking the eye for pressure. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it for that case. All right, moving on to the next topic. Uh, we're going to cover uh, vitreous opacities here. We're about uh, 20 minutes in at this point. So we're probably about 10, 10 more minutes. Um, to go. Actually, I'm sorry, we're about uh, 25 minutes in, so about five, 10 minutes we'll be done with this presentation. And uh, I'll just remind you there's another presentation associated with this one by Dr. Uh, Blake Eisenhagen. Uh, so hopefully you guys can watch that one as well. Um, so vitreous opacities, or as I like to say, doc, these floaters are driving me crazy. So <laughs> these patients, when they have floaters, they know they're there and they're bothered by them. And for a long, the longest time we didn't do anything about it. We kind of said this is you know, not an, a surgical indication. That mindset has changed in our field over the years for a number of reasons, including the fact that the uh, surgery has become a lot uh, easier. So before we get into that, let's talk about the pathophysiology of floaters. Uh, when we talk about that, uh, we're talking about vitreous synteresis, and that's breakdown of the proteins in the vitreous, fibronectin and laminin. 
Uh, this is usually associated with the PVD. Um, and what's happening is that the vitreous is liquefying and condensing at the same time. It's breaking down and it's clumping. And as it clumps, that's when the patients are getting the floaters. That's what they're seeing. So there are multiple small series and some larger series uh, that discuss outcomes regarding uh, vitrectomy for floaters. Uh, we're going to go over some of that in a minute. But this is what the patient, this is what we're seeing when we look in the eye. These are the clumps that I'm talking about. Uh, you can see that. And what, what's happening is that the the vitreous gel is clumping up, causing these opacities. We can call them, you know, vitreous condensation, vitreous, vitreous floaters, vitreous opacities. This all means the same thing. Um, another image, and you can see here how it, it casts shadows on the retina. This is what's bothering the patient. This is what we see. Here's another image uh, head on on the right, but on the left, you can see what the patient sees. So they're, they're seeing, it looks like little amoebas or paramecia. This is an optos appearance on a patient that, that I saw recently is what it looks like. So it can look like a big, big clump when you're looking in. Uh, you can also do B-scan ultrasonography, um, you know, to determine what's going on here. This is a patient with pretty severe uh, floaters. This is actually a case of a patient with vitreous hemorrhage, uh, and a lot of this is dehemoglobinized blood. So that's why it's so pronounced. But you can see floaters on a B-scan too if they're severe enough. Variant of this is asteroid hyalosis, where patients have calcium deposition within the vitreous. Uh, these are located primarily in the anterior vitreous. It doesn't affect visual acuity very much, but uh, they do cast shadows on the back of the eye, and patients can be bothered by floaters with asteroid hyalosis. Um, so this is what patients see with vitreous opacities or floaters. Uh, you know, on a bright, sunny day, blue sky, they're getting these clumps, and it, it's bothersome to these patients when they see them. It can be this severe, uh, really blocking their view. Blocking their view, it looks like fuzz on a camera there. Same thing there, same thing there, looking at the sky. So it's interesting when we, when we talk about these patients, um, the, uh, uh, you know, it, it's interesting that some patients will have severe floaters and not notice them, and others, uh, and in others, it won't be so bad. Um, and, uh, you know, um, they don't look so bad to us, but they're, you know, they're really bothering them. So. Uh, it, 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 we really have to uh, go by, number one, what the patient is noticing, but number two, what we're seeing. And we'll go over the protocols and criteria for um, the track rate for floaters. Um, and uh, before I do that, uh, I want to go over some of the studies uh, that talk about the track for floaters, because now we have uh, a few series. Um, and really, when we go back to, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was a, a study by Tan et al. in uh, American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2011. Uh, where they were looking at um, uh, vitrectomy for floaters prior to the microincision vitrectomy surgery era, um, and, and when uh, surgeons were actually inducing a posterior vitreous detachment intraoperatively. Uh, and uh, in this article, uh, they cite that there was a 30% retinal tear rate uh, in that era because of these uh, phenomena. So that was unacceptable. That's why we didn't do it back then. Uh, and then we're talking 20 years ago at this point um, for the for this series that Tana et al. was referring to. More recently, Wan et al. in uh, Investigative Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in 2013 looked at 66 eyes. Uh, and this is one of the better series that we have on this. Uh, there was a PVD present in 67%. There isn't always a PVD, but there, but there can be. Uh, now we don't induce one if there isn't, and that we found to be much safer. This is a patient that had myopia, asteroid hyalosis, old blood, number of reasons for vitreous opacities, 12 month average follow up, 98.5 um, resolution of symptoms, 0% serious complications, 19% cataract formation in phagic patients within an average of 16.5 months. Zong et al., 91% uh, subjective improvement, 0% complication rate. Uh, and then Singer et al., uh, San Antonio series, 0.8% RD rate, 50% of those patients are highly myopic or have recent phago little higher rate there in this series than the other series. And then another smaller series looking at 27 gauge retractomy, which we do as well uh, at uh, Retin Associates for symptomatic floaters using topical anesthesia with three patients that, that did well. Um, and so, you know, the justification for the topical anesthesia is a simple procedure. Why give a retro ball bar? An option there would be that modified retro ball block that I showed you guys, um, which we'll show again in a video uh, coming forward here. So, I'll start at the bottom of this slide. You know, the bottom line here is this is a low risk procedure. When you, you know, look at all the studies, zero to 1% complication rate, probably closer to zero, and a high success rate, 91 and 99% symptom resolution immediately uh, in these patients. Again, probably closer to 99. Um, 
what are the criteria to determine somebody needs surgery? As I mentioned previously, patient must be symptomatic. Just because we see the floaters, it might look terrible to us, but we're not going to do surgery if the patient's not symptomatic. Uh, floaters have to be there for a while, preferably more than six months, um, because sometimes they, they'll just go away. Uh, unless the patient's really, really bothered by it, if they're a driver or something that's really putting their life in danger. Um, uh, floaters must be visible to us. So, so patient could have symptoms, but if we can't see them, uh, I'm not going to want to take them out because we need to know what we're operating on. You can verify their presence with an optos, ultrasound if necessary. We can do bilateral cases uh, one to two weeks apart. Uh, this is important. We want to treat retinal breaks, lattice degeneration, or areas, weak areas of the retina, or any areas of concern preoperatively with uh, prophylactic laser retina fixing. We can do 25 or 27 gauge retrectomy surgery for this is a five to 10 minute sutrose procedure. The patient can be phagic or pseudophagic. Um, I wanted to do a quick word on YAG vitriolysis. There's a few series that exist in the literature on this. Uh, this is one from Sosa et al. Uh, this year, actually, 32 eyes. I'll just cut to the chase here. Um, it's a safe procedure, um, but compared to the 98.5 total and immediate improvement uh, with parsimony of vitrectomy, uh, with the YAG vitriolysis, you have 56.2% total improvement, and this series is pretty representative. Um, of floaters and 37.5% partial subjective improvement. So a much smaller percentage of patients having uh, total and immediate improvement. And it, with the agvitriolysis, this happens over time and that's months. So this is not something that we typically recommend for our patients. We, uh, you know, it's, uh, given the fact that uh, parsplane of vitrectomy is safe um, and effective, it's a much uh, uh, smoother route to take uh, for these patients to direct, we're actually going to accomplish the goal and the mission, uh, which is to get rid of the floaters and media. This is what these patients want. Um, you know, 56%. If you have some floaters, it's, it's still bad. So 56% total improvement is not acceptable to these patients. It really needs to be closer to 100. Uh, and with a safe procedure, there's no reason not to do that. So I'm going to finish up with the video on vitrectomy for floaters, uh, just to show you how simple it is. Uh, this is uh, really the same thing I was showing you before. We're doing the modified retrobulbar block here, which is very safe. We're not going through the lid. We have total control of what's going on. Get a little chemosis, but we can smooth that out with a cotton tip. We're gonna put the ports in. Again, 10 to and eight o'clock positions. And infusion cannula in for temporally. We're gonna uh, use a little Aki coat there on the corner. So you can see what we're doing using the bio one angle system. And we're just going in and we're taking out the vitreous condensation. You can see it there, uh, see them there in the light pipe reflecting. This patient you can see uh, super temporally had a, uh, as a right eye, uh, had an old tear, oftentimes they do. Um, they've had a PVD, they had a tear, the floaters are bothering them. Sometimes there was some blood that stained the floaters, it's been bothering them for months. We go in, we clear it out. And honestly, these are the happiest patients. Little subconjunctival antibiotic, ports come out and no sutures, and we're done. So that's what tricked me for floaters. Um, so I wanna thank you uh, for joining uh, me tonight. Um, and uh, hopefully we've accomplished our objective. So if you wanna assess yourself, since we're not in a group setting, uh, just be sure that as a result of this presentation, you can define vitromacular adhesion and vitromacular attraction, uh, that you can discuss the International Vitromacular Attraction Study Group classification model. Uh, that you can identify the indications for epiretinal membrane surgery and discuss its prognosis, uh, uh, specifically based on the ectopic interfilial layer classification scheme. Uh, that is a new thing that we talked about tonight. Um, you can impress your friends with that information. And that you can discuss the risks and benefits of vitrectomy for floaters. Uh, once again, everybody stay uh, healthy and safe through this uh, COVID era that we're in. Um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact me should you have questions or anything you want to discuss, patients that fall under these diagnoses or any others, uh, myself or any of my partners would be more than happy uh, to talk to you uh, anytime. And once again, thank you for listening and watching.